think it was September, Scott, the editor of the Cairo Review, got in touch with me and he asked me to write something about democracy in the Arab world. So I was thinking to myself, I've been writing about this issue for a while now. I didn't want to be boring and predictable, so I wanted to find an interesting angle. And I guess around that time, something was kind of bothering me. I've been talking about how the status quo is untenable, Egypt is about to explode. I've been talking about that for a while, but the thing is, it didn't end up happening. So we started talking like that in 2005. Arab Spring, people are mobilizing. Five years later, it just seems to be getting worse. Authoritarian regimes are pushing back, clamping down on the opposition. So I think a lot of us started to think, we've been talking about Egypt on the brink for so long now, and others have been talking about it since the early 1980s. So wait, so Egypt is on the brink this long, but it never quite, it never quite tips over. So I started to, I guess one way of putting it is reassess my optimism, or maybe optimism is not the right word, but my expectations that Egypt was really going to go through this, this massive change. And I think part of it was my frustration with U.S. policy as well. And I, I started to see the problematic role that not just not the Obama administration, but just U.S. administrations in general were playing. And I started looking more at the colored revolutions of Eastern Europe. So first Serbia, then Georgia and Ukraine. And one common thread that I saw in those revolutions was the importance of Western assistance. Western training of activists, of transmitting information to people on the ground. How do you how do you start a revolution? How does change happen? And you know, they had models. So the Georgians had the Serbian model, the Ukrainians had the Georgian model, but in all of them, millions of dollars were funneled in, both um, openly and covertly to the Eastern European activists on the ground. And looking at other transitions that have happened over the last several decades, and a number of scholars have written some really, some really good articles and books about this lately, about the importance and centrality of the Western role, and particularly the US. So if we're talking about Latin America, Eastern Europe, um, parts of Africa, the US hasn't always played a negative role. Yes, the US has a pretty bad record on democracy prom promotion in the Middle East. But if we look elsewhere, the U.S. has done some good things here and there and really helped facilitate these transitions. And talking to activists too, and maybe I just sort of started to absorb this from them too much, is this obsession with the centrality of America, that it wasn't about them, it wasn't about the people on the ground, it was about America blocking the democratic aspirations of the Arab people. So I remember talking to a senior official in the Al-Ghad party, a close associate of Ayman Noor, when he, uh, when he was in DC of, um, a few months back. And he said something like, well, reformers in other countries, they had the world behind them, but we have no one. And I kept on hearing that over and over. And Islamist groups and the Muslim Brotherhood here in, here in Egypt has a particular phrase for this, the American veto. That America, so regardless of what Egyptians want, yeah, they want democracy, they want change, America has a veto over these democratic aspirations. So then this whole theme of the lonely opposition came to mind, the lonely opposition. They have themselves, they're here, you know, they're mobilizing, they're trying to mobilize here in Egypt but they're lonely in the sense that the world might be watching, but the world doesn't seem to care. So then tell me how you maybe changed your thinking when you saw the events of the in Tunisia. I didn't see Tunisia coming. Let's we'll just put that out there. But then again, no one did. I'm actually not aware of even one Middle East analyst in the world who predicted Tunisia. So after Tunisia happened, it sort of undermined my case a little bit because the U.S. and France in particular were not behind the Tunisian revolution. The U.S. was pretty quiet until the final days and France was actually in, in some ways firmly behind Ben Ali, even offering 
to provide security assistance against the protesters. So here we have the West, not on the right side of history, and yet the Tunisians still manage to, to overthrow first their president and, and a lot of the old regime elements. The Tunisians revolted. And, and I, saw, I think a lot of us were trying to make sense of that. What does that mean vis-a-vis -vis the international factor? So I started to kind of revise my assessments in, in, in light of the article that I was working on. So how does Tunisia fit into my argument about the international role? I still had the sense, like I think a lot of people did, that Tunisia was, it wasn't as relevant to the other Arab countries. Yes, it was an inspiration. Everyone was excited about it. But really would, it, what happened in Tunisia, would that apply to a country like Egypt? Tunisia has a unique set of circumstances. So then I went back to this idea of, of the Western back. Tunisia was expendable. Yes, there was an alliance with the U.S. and all of that, but the U.S. was not close to Ben Ali. And you know, we lost Tunisia, not a big deal. It wasn't crucial to the regional scene. It didn't play a major role in the peace process. Fine. Egypt to me always seemed to be different. Jordan was different. These are countries that are firmly part of the pro-American orbit. So the U.S. might be okay with Ben Ali scurrying off to Saudi Arabia, but would they really want to see the fall of the Egyptian regime? A regime that they've supported with billions of dollars for the last 30 years. A regime that they've come to depend on for help on a whole number of regional issues, counterterrorism, uh, supporting the peace process, the list goes on. So there was a sense that the U.S. would be forced into a very difficult dilemma and they really wouldn't be on board with the people power. And that actually turned out to be the case. I think the Obama administration, in its response to Egypt, was behind the curve almost all the way through. Yes, there were some good statements here and there, but they always seemed to be in the position of reacting rather than shaping events. And that's why up until, you know, I was always, the U.S. isn't behind this, Mubarak might just stay because he feels like he might have the tacit support of the Obama administration, but you know what I think the major takeaway of Egypt is? Egyptians said enough is enough. They said we're not going to leave the streets until we get what we want. And there was nothing the U.S. could do about it. So we can have a debate about whether the U.S. was supportive of the protesters or less supportive. But either way, this was about them on the ground. They made this happen and they were playing the starring role, not the U.S. So again, this called into question the, the focus on the international role. That said, in, in, in kind of revising the article, or a better way of putting it would be coming up with a new article that deals with some of the same themes in a different way, I still think the international factors are important. I think this time, though, they'll be important for the transition. So Egyptians had their revolution. The U.S. is going to play a very critical role in facilitating that transition to democracy. Because as I mentioned earlier, Egypt is not yet a democracy. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Egypt hasn't organized a free and fair election for more than six decades. This is all new. We're going into unprecedented territory. Egyptians are going to need help. They're going to be the ones in, in the driving seat, but they will benefit from international assistance during what's going to be a difficult, messy phase.